Welcome back to another video this is part 10 of what if Issei was almost killed by Rias Gramori like share and subscribe for more alright let's begin. Chapter 46, Some Real Talk, Scene, Yasaka Castle, Kyoto Japan, Era, Era, you just rest my darling, I shall return shortly. Kisu, we now see Yasaka, kneeling over a sleeping Issei as she kisses his flushed cheek. Rising from position, the blonde proceeds to leave the room while quietly sliding the rice paper door closed. Walking down the large hallway, Yusaka occasionally nods back at random guards and staff as they respectfully bow in her presence. Finally, near the large den, a pair of guards slide open the door while bowing. Proceeding accordingly, this large room is, once again, inhabited by none other than Kuroka, Opus and Great Red. Kuroka was sitting comfortably on a love cushion as she was looking back and forth in between Red and Ophis. The said dragons were standing on opposite sides of the room, both with their heads looking at their own feet. Red was leaning against a far wall as chewing sounds could be heard, which suggested that he was, once again, munching on his toothpick. Ophis, on the other hand, was eating a small piece of cake while also looking toward the ground. Yusaka's entrance did nothing to change the atmosphere. The fox then decided to speak up while knowing two important things. The first being, Issei has a questionable yet very powerful friend. The second and more important of the two was, Issei was safe and at home. Great Red Sama, I would like to have a word with you, regarding your future ventures with my husband. Turning his head upward and returning eye contact with the fox queen, Great Red nods, though his facial features suggest a slight hint of sadness. I, Yusaka of Kyoto, welcome you, Great Red Dragon Sama, into my household. Ophis immediately transformed into her child form as she began to stomp on the ground while raising her hands into the air. Un, 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 unacceptable. First, first he takes my home. Now he takes my other home. Baka, Great Red now begins to grin. Yusaka interrupts Ophis's tantrum and completely dismisses her random transformation. Ophis Chan, stop that right now or I will send you off to timeout. Stopping her tantrum, Ophis tilted her head and attempted to comprehend what a timeout is. Realizing that she wasn't talking to her own daughter, Yusaka shook off the blush that comes with motherhood and continued to speak. Anyway, as I was saying, Great Red Sama, you can stay, on some conditions of course. Red began to laugh which ticked off Yusaka. I do what I like, lady. Besides, I'm a badass who ain't afraid of, ah. Stop that, it hurts. Yusaka somehow managed to appear directly in front of Red, while grabbing both of the man's cheeks in each of her hands as she stretched and stretched. Yusaka had a very sadistic grin on her face which actually terrified Great Red. Nothing scares Great Red, golden eyes starring you down. Okay. Maybe a few things scare Great Red. Never knowing or having a mother himself, this created an unknown weakness the dragon had never known. What was the weakness you ask? The fear of the wrath of an angry mom. Ophis felt the intimidating presence terrifying in her own way. Ah yes, Sensei did warn me that I should never cross, mother. Ophis shuddered. With his smirk, completely removed, a terrified frown was now placed on the face of Great Red. Please, stop stop it okay okay i will listen to you fox stop goddamn it why does this hurt so much yusaka pulled harder as she grinned even more watch your language too especially around my little daughter oh you want me to let go era era fine call me mommy say mommy please forgive my terrible behavior earlier i promise to be a good red dragon from now on now your turn era era deciding that this woman somehow had power of a creature such as himself. Great Red came to the assumption that Ophis was also cautious of this demon of a fox queen. F. Fine, I give. Just let go, it hurts ya, see. Ouch, okay, I'll say it. Erm, mommy, please forgive me, okay. There I said it. Releasing the Great Red, Yusaka began to laugh into her kimono sleeve. Fufufu, it seems you just need a firm hand. Right. So, here are the rules. As Great Red rubbed both of his swollen and red cheeks, he continued to nod as Yusaka laid down the ground rules. Scene, Aika's home, Kuo, Japan. Sitting in a normal-looking teenage girl's bedroom, we see Kitase and Murayama, both on Aika's bed. Meanwhile, 
the said Aika is resting in a comfy chair next to her computer. Both Kendo girls were listening very carefully as Aika continued. So that's what happened with Issei, the occult research club and the rundown of the supernatural in general, any questions? Both Murayama and Katase looked at each other, then each girl shrugged. So, are you telling me that Hyodo has his own TV show, in hell? Katase was overcome with the information that she was only beginning to digest. Murayama spoke next, so, the entire underworld and heaven, they are all looking for, for Issei. Aika smirked and nodded, yes to both questions. Now, let's talk about the two of you, becoming my heart-bound warriors of lust. Instantly, in front of both kendo girls, they saw Aika glowing with a bright pink and purple energy. This happened as the glowing girl casually removed her pink glasses and continued to her wide grin. Katase and Murayama reached for each other and were now hugging as they gasped at what was standing in front of them. Chapter 47, Crunch Time. Scene, Aika's home, Kuo, Japan. Katase and Murayama were still hugging each other as they looked on in complete shock. Clearly, Aika wasn't playing some kind of joke with them, as they both subconsciously assumed it was indeed just a joke. After the pink and purple glows began to die down, something was clear. Aika was not human. Wearing what looked to be a purple latex S&M outfit, Aika was also sporting a pair of purple horns from her head. These were accompanied with a purple tail, which had a reverse heart-shaped paddle toward the end. Lastly, a small pair of purple and pink bat-like wings were now sprouted from Aika's back. Her skin color has also changed to a bright shade of pink while winking at both girls with crimson-red eyes. Laughing as she decided to crack her tail into the air, making loud clapping noises Aika then points at both girls while smirking. This gave the kendo girls a good luck of Aika's new teeth, which were sharp. Behold my power! Still hugging each other, Murayama yelled out while closing her eyes. Don't take our souls, you evil demon! Katase then nodded while creating a crucifix sign using both of her hands and fingers. Aika then paused for a moment while watching the actions of the kendo club girls. Smiling once again, Aika spoke up while sitting back down in her computer chair as she crossed her legs. Really? Well, I suppose it can't be helped. I know, mother's stash. Katase and Murayama seemed to calm down as Aika casually walked past them and outside of her room, leaving the two alone. Before they were able to say or do anything, Aika returned while holding a wooden box. Girls, get down here on the floor, we are gonna partake in some good stuff. Then, when the two of you have calmed down, we can continue our discussion and the matters of a contract or two. Both girls looked at each other, then a sitting Aika who was opening the wooden box. Instantly a smell came from the box, an odor that was not all that unfamiliar. Katase instantly smiled as Murayama held a finger over her nose. Well, aren't you gonna help me smoke this? Katase's smile grew even wider as she noticed that the demonic Aika now had a freshly rolled marijuana cigarette in between her lips. Murayama protested, we have to do pee tests for the club, don't, Katase. Shaking her head no, Katase replied. Murayama, clearly Aika is a demon or something, the teen is interrupted as Aika speaks over her. Succubus, Katase, I am a succubus, emphasis on the suck part, era, era, now I am getting excited hee hee. And yes, girls, you have nothing to worry about, I have powers and ways of getting around such trifling things such as urine analysis tests. Now, last time I asked, get down here and one of you take this smoldering thing. Katase winks at Murayama and jumps off of the bed and sits next to Aika while accepting the cigarette. Murayama rolls her eyes and eventually joins the two on the floor. Scene, the dimensional gap. In a large void, full of nothingness and light, we see a bubble in the distance. Upon closer inspections, we see that this bubble is inhabited by several individuals. Valley and a blonde man were standing near the edge of this magically enclosed sphere. This man was no other than Arthur Pendragon, a close associate of Valley Lucifer's. He was holding his Excalibur sword as if he was directing where this sphere of energy was going. Behind the two men, we can see Graphia, Azazel and finally, Sirzex herself. Multiple facial expressions, which varied, had one thing in common, fear. Whatever you do, you must not leave this sphere, for the void is deadly to most beings. Also, 
Two great powers inhabit this place, we must do our best to go unnoticed. Valley and the rest of the group nod, aside from Azazel, who was grinning. Graphia was the next to speak up. Look over there, do you see it? That black void that has no light passing through it, you see it, right? Sirzex nods, yes, Valley, Arthur, take us that way, please. As they make their way to this very large and cube-shaped structure, they realize that Graphia is correct, only pure darkness, that was what the thing looked to be made from. Deciding to place her hand outside of the protective sphere, Sirzex touched the large mass, only to feel what seemed to be metal. Knocking on it a few times, this structure was clearly not meant to be penetrated by physical means. Valley, is there any way you could get away from this area, while leaving me outside, temporarily, as I shoot a blast of destruction to create an entrance? Arthur replies, not needed, please stay where you are and allow me. Ahem. Arthur composes himself and swings his sword at the mass in front of him. Caliburn, clear the way. After a gold slash of power, a large crack was made, large enough for the sphere to pass through. After passing through a great deal of what looked to be clouds, an image of a large field lay in front of the travelers. In the distance of this field was a strange-looking black and purple, human-sized, doll house. Sirzex, Graphia, Valley and Arthur study the surrounding areas within this place. Meanwhile, Azazel pulls out a pocket watch, however, as the watch cover opens, it reveals a high-tech scanner of sorts. Everyone's attention is back to Azazel when his instrument starts to make an alert sound. Shit, guys, everyone, we need to get out of here. Azazel was no longer smirking, rather, he looked terrified. My Azazel Tron 3000 is picking up traces of spiritual residue from a multitude of creatures and pantheons. The two that I am concerned about are the Ouroboros Dragon and the Great Red Apocalypse Dragon. Realizing that he was also picking up Issei's signature among that of a Nako Demon and Fox Demon, this created a panic moment. If they stay here, they will most definitely find the kid. Well, Ophis must have made this place, for what reason, I don't know. Also. What's up with Great Red? Guess I better pay the little Opai Dragon a visit later on. Shaking off his own thoughts as he had worried team members, staring back at him with their jaws agape, Azazel decided to point in the direction in which they originally came in. Everyone seemed to nod in unison as they made their way out of the pocket dimension. Azazel's smirk returned. Chapter 48, Introductions. Scene, Ika's home, Kuo, Japan. So, now that the three of us are more relaxed, how about I introduce you to your other teammates? Kates was chugging a bottle of green tea while Muryama was smiling and giggling. As succubus, Aika looked at the two, she then grinned and produced a pink heart heart-shaped communication circle next to her left pointed ear. Oh ladies, how about you come next door and introduce yourselves to our newest additions, the heart-shaped circle pulses with pink light. Right now, can it wait? I am just about finished with this level. Ika smiles embarrassingly. Press the pause button for hell's sake. Get your adorable asses over here right now. Sniff sniff, bring some incense while you're at it. Then, an interesting thing happened. The pink and heart-shaped circle began to grow and grow. Then, ha! This made Katase and Murayama get out of their current days as they jumped a bit from the loud noise. Creak, Ika's bedroom door opened and two other girls walked in. One of them was very tall with long blue hair. She had wild-looking eyes, yellow in color. Meanwhile, the female next to her was much smaller. Blonde and messy-looking hair, which was hastily tied in two pigtails, this girl had an irritated look to her. Her eyes were blue however they were shaped as if she was a bird of prey. To make matters more interesting, the two were also wearing the same outfits as Aika was currently wearing. Pink and purple S&M outfits, latex in material, these outfits left little to the imagination. The large and blue-haired of the two, she stuck out more so as she was wearing a maroon overcoat which reached her knees. After a few moments of quiet and awkward staring, Ika finally spoke up while grinning once more. Kala Warner Chan, Mittelt Chan, please, allow me to introduce you to Kates and Ryama. They both are very familiar with our little Isei-kun. Kates was squaring the two up while Ryama was smiling pleasantly and offering her hand out for a friendly greeting. Scene, Gregory. So clearly, going to that place was a bad idea. 
Regardless, I suggest checking back in with the others, see if they found anything useful. Azazel was doing his best to look serious as he was speaking, however he really wanted to burst out laughing. Sirzex nodded, well, thank you, Vali and Arthur, for the assistance. As promised, if we hear anything, Vali nodded and interrupted. Same on our side, until then, good luck. Sirzex smiled as Vali and Arthur vanished in a teleportation circle. Well, I suppose we should call it a day for now. Let's say we meet up tomorrow and try another strategy, yeah. Sirzex and Grafia looked at Azazel with frowns, however they nodded and went their separate ways. After a bit of time, the governor decided it was time to check on Issei. At first, we can see the man, on his knees, looking under furniture within his own office. Hmm, can't be too careful. After about 20 minutes of a thorough search, the governor was satisfied that he wasn't being spied upon. Flash, Azazel vanishes in his own circle. Seen, Yusaka Castle, 8 hours earlier. We start out looking into Yusaka's master bedroom. Inside, on the mat style bed, Issei is laying on Yusaka's lap as he looks to be unconscious. Placing a cool towel over Issei's flushed forehead, Yusaka warmly smiles. Era, Era, I hope my precious little fox has learned a valuable lesson. Though I must admit, I have, in my time, perhaps I might have overindulged myself, fufufu. Yusaka now has a sleeve over her mouth as she quietly giggles to herself. The Fox Queen gets startled when she receives a reply from a no longer sleeping Issei. Yusaka-sama, I am so sorry. Ouch. The brown-haired teen immediately reached for his head as he began to feel a very powerful headache coming off. Pushing him back down, Yusaka places her free hand over Issei's forehead. Era, Era, even though you deserve some discomfort after the stunt you pulled, still, I suppose I can do this as it seems to be impossible to stay mad at you. After her words, Issei felt warmth all over his body. After a quick and golden flash, Issei felt right as rain. Wow, Yusaka-san, thank you. But, I'm really sorry. It's just, I was there for what seemed like weeks. Then, out of nowhere, Great Red showed up. What can I say? I didn't think about the time thingy difference. Anyway, really, after everything you guys have done for me. Feeling a finger touching his lips, Issei can see Yusaka looking into his eyes with a warm crescent-shaped smile. Knowing that you are truly sorry makes me very happy. After all, you quite literally have a vast majority of the supernatural hunting you down. Yes, I understand that you were under great Red Sama's care, however, not communicating such such, such, shenanigans, yes, Issei, darling, just don't ever do it again. I am your wife, you are mine. Issei now feels tails begin to wrap around him as he continues to lay on Yusaka's lap. Bash. The bedroom sliding door is forced open. Kuroka is standing at the entrance with a tick mark on her temple. NYA. It's my turn. I played all of the cards, all of them. So, it's kitten making practice time, my Issei. The Nekomata begins to chant something as purple energy waves start to appear around Issei. After the chant was over with, Kuroka then snaps her finger. Within a moment, the brown-haired team, which was laying on Yusaka's lap was now gone. Yusaka shook her head and rolled her eyes. Fine, but I swear, Kuroka-san, if you leave any scratch marks on my Issei, there will be hell to pay. Kuroka grins as she begins to slide the door shut. Can't promise anything. NYA. Chapter 49, An Encounter. Scene, Aika's home, Kuo, Japan. Well, 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 it looks as if you are desperate for teammates. PFFT, the tall and blue-haired Calawarner was glaring down at the Kendo girls with her stern yellow eyes. Murayama sneered, don't talk down to us, Amazon. Katase pointed her finger at Calawarner and scowled. Sticks and stones, bitch. The smaller mid-elf spoke up while moving in between the two kendo girls and Calawarner. Everyone, shut up, stop being a bunch of baka heads. Also, boss, here is the nag chamba. Mid-elf tosses Aika a small blue box. Nodding, Aika took a stick from the box and put her lighter under it. After smudging the bedroom with her incense, Aika then clears her throat while reaching for her glasses, which were still on the computer table. Murayama, Katase. Those girls over there are not human, rather, they are, Calawarner and Middelt both smirked and released their black feathered wings. 
Katais then made the Christian symbol of the cross against her forehead while screaming. Angels. Murayama looked more skeptical as she ran toward Middelt while grabbing hold of one of her wings. Stop that, foolish little mortal. We now see Murayama and Mittelt in this strange struggle as the taller of the two had the smaller one in a type of submission. Essentially, Murayama forced Mittelt into her lap as she sat down on the floor while rubbing the angel's blonde hair roughly. You are just precious. I've always wanted my very own little Cupid. Mittelt continues to struggle. How dare you? I am not that little. I am eons older than you. Unhand me at once. Murayama has her eyes closed as she maintains a warm and jitty smile as she holds on tightly to the struggling little angel. Meanwhile, Katase looks up at Kalawarner, who seems to be rather interested in the interaction going on with her teammate and Murayama, with that, she decides to stand from the bed and slowly make her way toward the tall woman. Standing with her arms folded, Kalawarner seemed very perplexed as to what was going on. I have never seen Middelt act like this before. Maybe it's the post-trauma from that terrible encounter with the Grimoires. Kala Warner was drawn out of her thoughts as she felt hands fondling her large breasts. Realizing that this was the other human, the tall angel attempted to break free as she made an uncharacteristic no. Katase had a very similar look to that of Murayama, as the two continued their unique and individual, affectionate embraces. Aika begins to cackle, Wahahaha, mom's special blend is really effective. Taking her time to smell the jar of what looked to be normal marijuana, Aika then begins to laugh maniacally, once again. Scene, Yasaka Castle. We are looking down a large and ornamental hallway. Noises are heard in the distance. We noticed Yasaka and little Kuno, who was holding her mother's hand. Please, cut it out. Kuroka, come on. Both foxes heard these noises coming from the guest bedroom that was now designated as Kuroka's. As the mother and daughter looked at each other with puzzled looks, the sounds of struggling were also heard. NYA, stop wiggling around or else. Having enough of this insanity, Yusaka crinkles her nose and slides the bedroom door open with intense vigor. Immediately, the fox queen puts both of her hands over her daughter's eyes as she attempts to come to terms with what was in front of her. On another mat style bed, we can see Issei and Kuroka. The Neko looks to be sitting in a cross-legged position while Issei looks to be sitting on said Neko's lap. Kuroka's twin black cat tails, had each one holding onto Issei's arms as he looked to be struggling. Meanwhile, Kuroka herself was purring while both of her hands were fondling Issei's furry and golden fox ears. Realizing that nothing lewd was happening, Yusaka lifted her hands from her daughter's eyes while her own eyes began to widen. Whiskers golden fox ears and a set of three golden and furry fox tails, Issei literally looked like one of Yusaka's lineage of fox yukai. Kuroka seemed to be oblivious to any changes in the bedroom as her eyes were closed while she had a very peaceful smile on her lips. Her, NYA, so soft, her, Kuno immediately shouted out loud. Papa Kun, look at you, you are so, cute, Yusaka nodded and produced her signature crescent-shaped smile, yes, it seems that your soul has accepted its new body. Kuroka, is this why you wanted to keep him close to you, last night? Kuroka opens her eyes, smiles and then winks. Like I said, Yusaka-sama, I played and continue to play my cards right, as of now, I got a royal flush. The fox queen smiles warmly. Kuno then makes another noise, this time it sounds like a shriek. Eek, who is that, over there? Everyone in the room turns their heads toward the far corner of the bedroom. In the shadows, small movements could be seen. Yusaka immediately produces a small blue orb of fox light and pushes it toward that specific dark corner. Immediately a body came into view. Crouched on the floor, with a video recorder, was none other than Ophis. She was back in her adult form, however she looked to be wearing a ninja costume. After everyone realizes who it is, Kuno then rushes over toward Ophis, what are you doing with that thing, Afi? Ophis looked indifferent at first, that was until the little fox princess tugged at her ninja costume. Now smiling a bit nervously, odd for Ophis the dragon god began to explain. I need information, sensei. I am not familiar with coitus. I must understand. Kuno tilts her head, what? Yasaka runs over and places both of her hands over Kuno's ears. Ophis-chan, darling. 
How about we all go downstairs and have breakfast? Yeah, Yasaka said this with a very embarrassed looking smile. Kuroka started to complain. NYA, it's still early and my Issei is so warm. Issei starts to struggle again. Opus then checks on her camera footage while smirking. Good information. Chapter 50, An Encounter Part 2. Scene, Kyoto, Japan. So boss, do you really think Issei is here? We see two females, dressed in black cloaks. At further glance we notice the faces of Gabriel and Irina. Looking back at the teenage angel, Gabriel smirks. Oh yes, my Issei is near, I can almost smell him. Looking a bit creeped out, Irina nervously smiles. Whatever you say, speaking of which, this city isn't very small. I've been here a few times back with my mom and dad for church stuff, so I know the layout a bit, though I am sure things must have changed since that time. Shaking her head no, Gabriel points in a specific direction. Looking over and up where the archangel was pointing, a large and Japanese-style structure could be seen, on the largest hill, directly in the middle of the city itself. Irina looks at the building in the far distance. Why would Issei be at some temple? Gabriel grins. I have it on good authority that a fox Yukai, by the name of Yusaka, lives in that castle. More importantly, I also know that Issei helped this fox's family during a scuffle with the hero faction. Since I can sense my special boy's aura, strange as it may be at the moment I know that he is indeed in this vicinity. Therefore, logic would dictate, Issei would be located within a familiar place with familiar people. Unless I am mistaken, the child does not have any family or friends within this region. That is, unless I am missing something. Irina Chan, do you have other information that I may have missed? Thinking very hard, Irina shakes her head no. Nah uh, I don't think he knows anyone here, except those Yukai. Gabriel Sama, you are so smart. Nodding victoriously, the Archangel begins to walk toward the destination in question as Irina follows closely behind. Scene, Yusaka Castle, we pan in on a picnic scene which is taking place in Yusaka's backyard garden. It looked to be something rather childish, as small teacups and random dolls were placed in small wooden chairs. On a wide yet low elevated and pink table, we see small cakes and sandwiches, along with sugar and cream. Multiple chairs with dolls were the main company as three actual people were sitting in random locations in between the puppets. Ophis, in her child form, was wearing a pink and black princess-style gown. Meanwhile, sitting a few chairs down was Kuno. The fox princess was wearing a matching black and pink gown. Both girls also had matching hair ribbons, though Ofa still wore her trademark lowly headpiece. Kuno was eating a cucumber sandwich while slurping a sip of tea. Lastly, we see Issei. He was sitting in one of the very small chairs as his knees were to his chest. He looked to be wearing a turn-of-the-century butler uniform. Realizing that after a small sip, he was already out of tea, the Red Dragon Emperor simply smiled a bit nervously. So, whose idea was this? Kuno, looking up at the teen with her mouth stuffed, the princess simply blushed and nodded cutely. Ophis then spoke up, so this is a, date, sensei, I don't, understand. Issei took a dry gulp and just kept quiet. Kuno finished her bite and then replied, well, kind of, I wanted us to be princesses and Issei to be our servant. Then, then, both of us start to fall in love with our servant and make him spend more and more time with us, and then, as Kuno was speaking, Ophis was paying attention and looked to be jotting down some notes on a magically produced clipboard. Issei thought that this scenario that Kuno was coming up with, sounded very familiar. Like something from one of his, Eki animes. Oh no, erm, Kuno, question kiddo. Looking up at Issei, the little fox nods. So, have you been reading manga comics by any chance? Kuno began to blush. Well, well, see, I found some things in Kuroka's room. Issei facepalms. Ophis continues to write notes down in her clipboard. Crash. A large and golden explosion happened near the back of the garden. Meanwhile, inside of the residence, inside Yusaka's bedroom, we can see both Kuroka and Yusaka standing from their seated positions. Both women had looks of sheer horror. Kuroka began to shake a bit however she forced herself to speak. Angels. Grabbing Kuroka's hand, both women stormed out of the room and down the hallway. Back in the backyard garden, Ophis was holding onto Kuno, as the black dragon god changed into her tall and curvy adult form. 
Issei was standing in front of Ophis and Kuno as his scale mail balance breaker was activated. Donned in his full crimson suit of dragon armor, Issei looked through the smoke only to see two silhouettes approaching. Ophis Chan, let me handle this. Please, get the princess to safety, get her to her mother. Tilting her head, Ophis replies. I will protect you, my mate. Issei's helmet turns from side to side while stating, No, Ophis, please, let me protect this home. After all, whoever these guys are, they are probably here because of Sorches and that Opai hunt thingy. I can't let anyone get hurt over this. I must protect you, all of you. Ophis, please, let me do this. Issei's arm began to glow. Ouroboros dragon, listen to my partner, we can decimate whatever this threat might be. Especially with the new power-ups from yours, the Neko's and the Fox's magic. It will be a one-sided victory for sure. Issei's helmet nodded in agreement. Looking down at the frightened Kuno, Ophis made a decision. Sensei, worry not, for I will return you to your mother. Issei, I will be back. Do not leave this place. Nodding, Issei replies. Thank you, Ophis chan The stoic black-haired woman then produced the slightest of smirks. Issei, you will spend this evening with me. Do you understand? Remembering that Ophis was randomly recording his sessions, yes, sessions, with Kuroka, the team shuddered a bit, however is his helmet still nodded. Looking behind the rear entrance to the large estate, Ophis could see several masked guards emerging with spears. Deciding that Issei had some help, it should be acceptable to get her sensei inside and into her mother's arms, Ophis began to run with the fox in her arms. She ran past the guards while holding Kuno's face into her shoulder. Now inside, Ophis can see Kuroka and Yasaka, sprinting toward her. Scene, backyard. The smoke cleared. Standing in the distance was Irina. Wearing a new white and gold set of armor, the twin-tailed brunette waved and smiled politely. Issei, it is you. Wow. The taller woman with very long and blonde hair also produced a wave of her own. Hello, Issei. My name is Gabriel. You don't know me, yet. But I know you, very well. So, how about you behave yourself and come along quietly? Issei tilted his head. Meanwhile, the guards standing behind Issei also tilted their heads. Wait, what, Irina? Explain what's going on. Playfully, knocking herself in her own head, while sticking her tongue out, Irina then regained her usual smile and spoke. Oh, Issei, silly. Well, the two of us are here to take you. Don't worry, it has nothing to do with that Rias bitch. In fact, we have zero plans on involving you with anyone, especially those from the underworld. Issei looked behind him and at the guards. Are you guys getting this? The guards all scratched the back of their heads. Yeah, me neither. Looking at him arm, Issei speaks. Dedrag, anything. Issei's arm pulses in green light. Afraid not, partner. Face palming his helmet, Issei looks on staring at the two women in front of him. Thanks for watching like share and subscribe for the next parts one got in my storage.